Hi, welcome. It's three o'clock. I think I'll start. I think I'm introducing myself. I'm Laura Einstein. <laughs> and this is Nomi Silverman. And Nomi and I were co-curators for this exhibition, WPA Jobs. And for Nomi, this is a double whammy because she's the art one. She has the one person show upstairs that uh, the art committee here put together. So Nomi, before you get off the stage on your part, I want you to talk a bit about your exhibition, so, which is not WPA, but it's a beautiful exhibition that Mary and Mickey put together from the art committee. So, well, it's nice to be back at New Canaan Library. I'm now the executive director at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Matthews Park, Norwalk. Uh, right next to Stepping Stones Museum for Children and Lockwood Matthews Mansion Museum. CCP's mission is to support, preserve, and advance the art of original prints. The center was founded in 1995 by Grace Shanley, a former New Canaan resident. It was established to support and encourage serious and emerging and professional artists in the creation of original prints and the process of printmaking. It offers both a, an historic and contemporary view of printmaking and encourages traditional techniques as well as modern technologies. Um, I have, uh, if you're interested in joining our mailing list, I have a sheet in back. Uh, most recently, we've installed an exhibition, WPA Jobs. It goes from March 28th to May 23rd, 2015. That highlights Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal Works Progress Administration, or WPA era original prints. It's a historic exhibition. And the reason that it's WPA jobs is that according to Susan Teller of Susan Teller Gallery in New York City, who lent to us 38 works of art for the exhibition, she said um, the most important reason that the WPA and Federal Art Project were instituted was put, to Mer put America back to work for jobs. So WPA Jobs seemed to be a good title. Um, CCP just received funding, hallelujah, from Connecticut Humanities. It was no easy task, let me tell you. For <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for a WPA Jobs lecture series that's starting next Sunday. So I encourage you, I have cards in back to come and spend some time with us. And we have wonderful speakers coming out to CCP who have a tremendous background in WPA. In fact, Wendy Jeffers, who spoke here a couple uh, last year for the Stoddard Art Lecture, is coming to talk about Holger Cahill, who was the director of, of the Federal Art Project. So I hope you'll join us at CCP for that, and all of our programs at CCP are free and open to the public. So from 1935 to 1943, the Federal Arts Project, FAP, was the Visual Arts Division of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal Works Progress Administration, or WPA, that employed approximately 5,000 artists with the purpose of creating prints, murals, and paintings detailing American life. And we called this from a radio address that Roosevelt gave in 1939. He said, art in America has always belonged to the people and has never been the property of an academy or a class. The great treasury projects through which our public buildings are decorated are an excellent example of the con continuity of this tradition. The Federal Art Project of the Works Prog Progress Administration is a practical relief project which also emphasizes the best tradition of the democratic spirit. The WPA artist, in rendering his own um, impression of things speaks also for the spirit of his fellow countrymen everywhere. I think the WPA artist exemplifies with great force the essential place which the arts have in a democratic society such as ours. So, how did the depression affect us in New Canaan? I am referring to research from Ginny Ryder who presented her work on the WPA at New Canaan Historical Society in 1994 and I have some of her writings in back. In 1929, with a stock market crash, America was catapulted into despair with foreclosures, locked factory gates, and dust storms in the Midwest. New Canaan had the highest number of unemployed white-collar workers per capita of any town in Connecticut. One out of eight residents was unemployed. In 1935, New Canaan had a population of 6,000, 
with 1,130 individuals and 262 families on welfare. At that time, New Canaan was able to apply and receive over $100,000 from New Deal programs in spite of the fact that in the Depression election of 1932, the vote in New Canaan was Hoover, 1,426, and Roosevelt, 746. So during the Depression, the art market was virtually shut down. In 1968, there was a survey of artists employed in the Federal Art Project. 65% said that they could not have existed during the 30s without the government support. 79% continued their art career after the federal programs ended, and 88% felt it, that it was a rich and satisfying experience. Until the government program, artists without hope, at the end of their resources, were given the freedom to work. Artists worked steadily for about $23 a week. The FAP, Federal Art Project, brought artists together who felt that they were part of an important art movement where their work would be seen by peers, by the public, and the art world. There was one rule to be followed, that artists had to depict the American scene. What was resulted was that New York in the 1930s became the center of the art world with a new aesthetic developing that was very different from the European artists that were exhibiting regularly at the Museum of Modern Art. We are looking at social realism, influenced by the Ashcan School of Artists, Robert Henry, John Sloan, et cetera, and abstract art that was developing with an American flavor. And by the way, the WPA prints that you'll see were abstract, as well as social realists, as well as a subject matter of entertainments that you'll see in a moment, and Nomi will talk about Schenker's work in a few minutes. The WPAR program was administered by, administered by dividing the country into 16 regions, with Connecticut under Region 1, New England, and the regional office was at the Is Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Artists from Fairfield County received application from Yale Art Gallery in New Haven. The government had two major mural programs, and the murals were placed throughout federal buildings. During its nine-year duration, 1,000 murals in new federal buildings were completed for an average price of about $1,356 for each one. Selection of murals were done by the jury, and uh, the jury system, and they evaluated sketches. The 15 members of New Canaan's Art Committee were three selectmen, the superintendent of schools, four members of the Board of Education, and several artists and other distinguished residents of the community. To do a mural, the building, uh, the building, the space, and the sponsors had to be found. The color, scale, and character of the painting had to harmonize with the surrounding architecture. The composition had to have clarity, largeness, and car carrying power. The subject had to be approved by the sponsoring committee, Largely, the subjects had to celebrate the nation's history, past glories, and work ethic. The mural sponsor and the community had to contribute materials, tools, supplies, and working space. Government regulations had to be met before anyone was officially on the payroll, and the artist had to complete the application and sign an oath of office. And also, the, the artist had to prove need, uh, financial need. Looking at the murals here at New Canaan Library in back, you see the history of transporta transportation by Lacita Ward and Gregg. Lacita studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Her family had fallen on hard times as her husband, who had been a successful industrial engineer, had lost his job during the Depression. So these murals here at the library deal with transportation. And you'll see in the back one Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, and Woodrow Wilson. So you'll notice, too, with the murals, that they presented an idealized view of American life. Idyllic, whereas the original prints were the vernacular daily life of the American worker, as Roosevelt pictured it, neighbor, neighbor, working, against, neighbor working next to neighbor, not against neighbor, next to neighbor. This is a Hugo, Hugo Gellert um, that uh, we have. We borrowed this piece. Uh, from Child's Gallery in Boston. And you can very much see the manship sculptures, Art Deco sculptures at Rockefeller Center, that musculature here. But it's uh, uh, 
And I'll get to the title of that in a moment because I have another image of that. But it, well, it's called The Working Day Struggle for 1933, A Normal Working Day, Two Workers Back to Back. And it's dated to 19, dated 1933, and it's a lithograph. This is not uh, a print. It's an oil painting that we borrowed from Susan Teller Gallery in New York City. And why do we have a painting here? Well, this is Harry Sternberg. He lived from 1904 to 2001. It's called Steel. It's oil on masonite. Sternberg is best known for his murals and his prints. And this shows you the transition of mural to printmaking. He was a very popular screen printer. And screen printing was very, became very popular in the 1930s. And uh, you know the work of Andy Warhol? And, Silk Screens, Andy Warhol uh, was a screen printer in the 1950s, 60s, and later. Um, but this is an oil painting with similar images uh, can be found uh, in Silk Screen. This type of printing became very popular during the Great Depression because the required materials were cheap, no press was needed, and it produced highly colored images. The artists could make screen prints in their garages or on the kitchen table. Um, and you can see in this piece, Harry Sternberg is, it's hot. You have the steel worker, you have the forge, you have the uh, molten metals coming down. You see the family members on the right, you see the factories on the left. You see the worker coming down up above the fire. So this piece is a hot, vibrant image uh, and very much uh, leads into, he was a famous mural painting, but it leads into silkscreen and he was a well-known silkscreen artist as well. So, uh, and I'll just give you a quote from Susan Teller. Um, Susan Teller said, um, Today, these works stand for the generation of Americans who endured one of the worst depressions this country has known, when to have a job was to have everything. Artists em empathized with strangers, friends, and families and recorded their hardship and struggle. We are indebted to them for documenting this era, era with dignity and grace. This is another Harry Sternberg called The Dance. I mentioned that also entertainments. Uh, this is dated to, it's called the Dance Superstition. It's a crayon aquatint with hand coloring and it's dated to 1940. This is a fascinating piece. It's by George Biddle. He lived from 1885 to 1973. This is called, it was, this piece was done in 1928. In English, it's called Buddy, Aren't You Ashamed of Yourself? And in Spanish, hombre, que, que se, se, I won't even try. <laughs> so he was born to an established Philadelphia family. Biddle attended the elite Groton School with, his, with a classmate, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In 1927, Biddle established a printing shop in New York where he began to explore lithography, a medium that he hoped would popularize American art by making it better known to the American <coughs> public. In the following year, 1927, uh, 1928, he traveled throughout Mexico on a sketching trip with artist Diego Rivera, a well-known muralist. Uh, actually, not a WPA artist because he was not an American citizen. In the 1930s, Biddle became a champion of social art and strongly advocated government funding for artistic endeavors. His correspondence with his former class classmate, FDR, and recently elected president contributed to the establishment of the Federal Art Project. Biddle himself completed a mural titled The Tenement for the Justice Department building in Washington, D.C., and served as president of the National Society of Mural Painters from 1935 to 1936. Will Barnett. And this, you will not, this is called Men in Ditch, and it's Central Park, New York City. This was, Will Barnett lived from 1910 to 2012. He just passed away, uh, just uh, lived a long life, 102. This is dated to 1936 and it's a lithograph. Uh, note the tenor of this piece. Uh, two men in, a, you know, these men in a ditch. You can see the factories in the back, they're working. 
It's a lithograph and it's signed in pencil. Will Barnett's career spanned over eight decades. He studied at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and the Art Students League in New York in 1930, where he developed an interest in printmaking. His association with the Art Students League is one of the longest in the League's history, remaining there as a teacher until 1980. Barnett was involved with the graphic art division of the WPA. He worked in many mediums, including woodcut, etching, lithography, and silkscreen. Barnett was a master printer, printing lithographs for the Mexican artist Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco. Michael Gallagher, you can see this. This is called Bootleg Coal. Michael Gallagher lived from 1898 to 1965, and this piece is dated to 1935. It's a linocut. Notice the androgynous, you know, this could be either male or female. Look at the musculature on the arm. Um, an early 20th century Pennsylvania artist, Michael J. Gallagher is known for his painting, lithographs, woodcuts, and book illustrations. He was accomplished at both figure studies and landscapes. Gallagher's most famous works of art are the original prints that he produced for the WPA. This is another work of his, Wood Gatherer, 1941. This is a wood, wood engraving. This was done in Philadelphia. He's noted for his scenes of city life and the Pennsylvania coal mining region. Gallagher was director of the Philadelphia Works Progress Administration's printmaking workshop. There, with two that you're going to hear about in a minute, Doc's Thrash and Hugh Messebaugh, he was instrumental in the development of a new Ontario process, the carborundum print that Nomi will talk about. <coughs> this is Riva Helfond, 1910 to 2002, number six colliery, and it's dated to 1937. And interestingly, at the lower left, the stamp is largely obliterated by the artist. Um, and this is something that I'd like to learn more about, but uh, some of these artists after the WPA ended tried to take off their stamp, FAP, because they thought that it uh, reduced the value of their work of art. And that's something I'd like to look into more. Riva Helfand was a painter, printmaker, and educator and was born in Brooklyn. She studied at the School of Industrial Art and the Art Students League, both in New York. Helfand taught in the WPA FAP programs in New York from 1936 to 1941 and was on the creative staff of the graphics division. And this is a fine impression of the large Pennsylvania mining scene with large full margins. Um, you can also, which is interesting about these WPA prints, tell geographical differences. So living in Manhattan, New York, you could see what it looked like across the United States without even leaving your home. In 1964, she taught printmaking at New York University with Harry Sternberg. In the early 30s under the WPA, she was instructor at the Harlem Arts Center where Bob Blackburn was the master printer and he was her student, and Nomi worked at Bob Blackburn's studio, studio, but that's a side note. From 1936 to 41, she worked in the New York WPA creating lithographs, woodcuts, etchings, aqua tints, and silk screens. Among her friends were de Kooning, Arshild Gorky, and the group from the Cedar Tavern that included Franz Klein as well. I think this is a beautiful print. You see this right as you walk into the exhibition uh, under our uh, head signage. Louis Lozowick, 1892 to 1973, subway station, 1976. Uh, he was born in the Ukraine and came to the US in 1906. His style often appears photorealistic at first glance. He took great pains in depicting bridges, buildings, silos, and machinery down to the last girder, rivet, and cable. In fact, the architecture you can see here has a brutal prominence in his work. He always seemed to insert some secondary subjects in his scenes, such as people, cars, trucks, steam shovels, barges, but he doesn't show any defining features in the faces of his people. Uh, people are always generic, but they are depicted laboring. Lazowick criticized certain aesthetic movements for not being in touch with the working man. 
leading one to believe that he saw laborers as dignified individuals rather than simple tools to be used for the benefit of society. Lind Ward, uh, approaching the L, dated in 1937 from Vertigo. It's a wood engraving. He is one of, believed to be one of the finest wood engravers of the 20th century. Uh, he took his work to a new dimension when he created the word, wordless novel so that you could get everything you needed to know from the depicted image. Um, he published Vertigo in 1937. He's, this story sold, uh, is told with 230 stylized woodcuts and was published more than 70 years ago in the midst of the Great Depression. So he told the whole story through visual images. This dramatic tale recounts through visual images three people dealing with financial instability, joblessness, and debt. A young girl who longs to be an accomplished violinist and a boy who hoped to become a builder found their dreams shattered by desperate economic times. When an elderly gentleman wields his power to cut his business losses, all three lives are changed forever. So that's Lind Ward Vertigo. Another piece by George Biddle, remember, uh, uh, FDR's roommate from Groton, uh, a lead in the WPA and FAP projects. Harman Warsager. Uh, uh, this is another piece that we have in our exhibitions and in our exhibition, and he uh, was largely a woodcut uh, artist. Um, he as and I have a quote from him. He said. There are all kinds of variations of each technique. I got enthused about color woodcuts. I got some big pieces of white wood or poplar and set myself up. All you needed was a spoon and some knives and one artist saw it, and before you knew it, there was maybe 40 artists doing color woodcuts. We created a whole movement which is still going strong. We had a couple of people doing colored woodcuts for the Federal Art Project, the graphic group. We had an opportunity to experiment. We had the printers, we had the lithographers, we had the men to print woodcuts, we had the men to print etchings, all of them very fine printers, which is so important to the making of a good print. I mean, a good artist is not necessarily a good printer. They are sometimes separate skills. But this is a work by Hyman Morsiger, and that's a quote from him. So with that, uh, this is another Michael Gallagher called Song of the Axe. This is the Hugo, Hugo Gellert that I showed you to begin with. And this is Doc's Thrash, and Nomi is going to talk about technique and how these works were done. All right, I'm still on one floor. <laughs> All right, um, so I, I wanna start first by um, mentioning about the difficulty of scholarship. So when, when people today, well, let me rephrase that. When people originally made prints, the things that we care about today, they didn't care about. They never numbered their editions. It was never like this is edition of 10 or edition of 15 or an edition means the same print reproduced, okay? They never talked about the technique in detail. They didn't really care about it. It was sort of like, here's the print, here's the image, you like it, you don't like it. That was what was important. But nowadays, the scholars do care about that. And so a lot of the times, there's guesswork involved. And a lot of times, they're wrong. And I, have, I can tell you, because I've gone to print fairs and gone and seen very, very, famous prints there that are just the wrong technique down. And I've told them and then I've decided, what does it matter? They don't care. <laughs> but, so there are prints in here which they say that they're one technique. I think they're another. I don't know if they're right or wrong. But what is important is the imagery and how fungible and how malleable all of these mediums can be. And so I've brought with me some show and tell for some of the uh, prints which you may or may not be familiar with. As we talk about them, I will try to describe these without um, too much 
um, inside baseball talk. And if I get, if you get confused or lost or you just want to ask something, please feel free to just raise your hand and like shout out a question or something. Okay, so this is Doc Thrash. He's one of the most famous artists of the WPA print era. And this is a beautiful little print. And, and one of the other things that I learned in my art history class was that scale is really wrong because this is a very small print. And when you see it, it's all, everything, whether it's a big mural or a little tiny two by two, it's all the same size here. So this is a really tiny little print and it's a beautiful little print. And as Laura mentioned, it is what's called a carborundum print. And what that means is carborundum is a grit like sand and it's used mostly in lithography which I will talk about later. Um, and what they did was there's three guys who sort of developed this technique. And um, they sort of scratch a stone like you would if you were using Ajax. And that creates a texture that if you were to ink it and print it, would print black. And then they burnish out, where you can see all the lights in there, they're all burnished out, which means they took a, a a honing thing, essentially, and sort of polished up where they didn't want any ink to hold. And it's, it's just a sweet, sweet little print. Um, it's really nice. And so anyway, those three guys sort of developed this print. And one of the things to think about is that this time not only was, surprisingly, was it was a time of great experimentation and a great excitement in terms of the world of art. I mean, you had a government who was behind you, which is really important. and. Um, uh, I think that that sort of helped lead to a lot of this experimentation. And they were sort of left alone. I mean, the, the government really, outside of the murals, they didn't really care what the prints were doing or saying. So, okay. So this print is a similar technique, but this is actually uh, a, a crayon aquatint. So this is an etching. And an etching is done, is done on a metal plate, and marks are made into it. Okay. And... What this was, this was a tonal mark where, again, he sort of prevented the acid from biting into the plate by using a crayon. And so it creates a similar but not quite the same uh, technique as the one before. It's got a grit to it, which really sort of suits the, the image of the coal miner and all of that. And so that's really important when you want to talk about the technique and the imagery serving to suit the image that you're describing. What is the best way to sort of enhance what you're talking about? Okay, this is a really, really, again, a nice little print. These are all pretty small, okay? And this one is done by a woman named Ida Abelman, okay? And this is a lithograph. <laughs> Where the heavy stone comes in. Okay, this is a lithographic stone. And the best lithographic stones are blocks from uh, oh, Bavaria. Thank you. <laughs> I'm having an, a senior moment here. Bavaria. OK. And essentially, what this does, and it's a whole chemical process, which I can't begin to describe. Even though I do them, I have no idea how it's done. I just draw them. Someone else prints them. But essentially, you take. Hang on a second. Grease. Okay, so grease. This is, it happens to be a grease crayon. You can use grease ink. You can use a tuna fish sandwich. You can use a squished hand. All of those have grease. You can put your hand on here, and that would that would print. And essentially, they would draw on the stone, and then through the magic of some kind of chemicals, it attracts. You, you know how. Right, well, it's, that's not quite, I think it it's not quite burning. It's like changing the chemical, the chemical um, composition of this thing. Of the stone, right. So that you have, you end up with your, the grease and the water do not mix. Right. And so the grease is attracted to your grease. So the grease of the oil is attracted and to the so grease. And you keep it wet, so you stop having the grease take, taking, taking off the, right. <coughs> and the one thing to, to realize is, and this is when you want to, when you get to see these prints or any lithography in person, look closely at them. Because of the nature of the stone, there's a million tiny little pit holes 
would best describe them. So when you make a line, it's not a solid line like you would if you were drawing on paper. And those little pit holes in there, when it's printed in black ink, it has a silvery quality to it that is unique and unique only to lithography, that is just beautiful. Now, m most stones are bigger than, most stones are bigger than these and weigh like a thousand tons. And so we have machines that move them, but this is the biggest, I could probably. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, so this is a really nice little, I love this print because of the, uh, besides the imagery of the man and the machine, it's almost, it's almost like his wig, which is kind of cute. Um, okay, so this is a wood engraving, which I didn't bring a piece of wood. I figured you knew what wood looks like. But um, wood is, is a very fine knife which carves out the white areas and then he rolls it up again. Suits the sort of the description of what's going on, which is in this case kind of the lights and the night and the drama of a preview or of what's going on in there, and, and that suits it really well. Okay, so this one is a, this one's a lino cut, I think. Or is this a woodcut? Either one, so, this one's a woodcut, I don't have it. <coughs> ah. Yeah, yes, th there are, there, and there's one coming up which, which is a, a dual, which they say one and I think it's another, but it could be, it could be either one. Again, a beautiful, sweet little print. This is a Gallagher again, who's, oh God, I love his work. Sorry. <laughs> another, another Michael Gallagher. You've got to see these in person. They're just so beautiful. Okay, this is the one I wanted to talk about. Okay, this one is listed as a lino cut. Linoleum. <laughs> okay, like it used to be on your floors. Sometimes you'll see them glued to boards, but most of the time they're just like this. Okay, and you take a very fine kind of knife tool and you cut marks in here. And again, you roll your ink on the surface and that's what prints, okay? I think this is a woodcut. It doesn't mean it is, but it goes to show you the sort of nebulousness of what these prints are. However it is, whether it's a woodcut, and the reason why I think it's a woodcut is has to do with seeing the kind of grain in there that you can see. Lionel cut, you usually don't see a grain. The texture of it, exactly. Um, now, it's possible he really roughed up the linoleum. Exactly, exactly. So I think this is a wood cut. But either way, the roughness of the wood and the roughness of his mark making really suit the kind of roughness of a family fighting for food. And it's called competition, yeah, it's just, it's really in incredible. Okay, we go back to, this is a lithograph again. Um, just like the one that Laura showed you, the first one. Beautiful. <laughs> Definitely, if you, oh, it also makes you think, for those who know it, the social realists of Russia, the Russian social realists. They, they sort of really stole that. <laughs> Okay, another beautiful little lithograph. I'm just showing you what I'm going through here. These are all lithographs, and this is the range of kind of, you don't want to think of anything as a kind of a technique because you can manipulate any, any technique to, to sort of have its own, your own mark on it, but these are an example of the ranges of things that you would see. This one's also another lithograph. This is moving day, I believe. Oh no, uprooted, sorry, it's called uprooted. Which is sort of, <coughs> I find be beautiful in the uprooted of the tree and the uprooted of the family. And I think in, in all of America, a lot of people were uprooted. But it's got a beautiful, the mark making in the sky is something which you haven't seen in any of the other lithographic prints. Okay, so this is an etching. Again, small, you really can't see sc scale, but it's about that big, six by nine, something like that. Um, this, isn't, this is 
we use the term intaglio, uh, or let me rephrase that. I use the term intaglio to um, separate it. People will say etching, but some of these terms have very specific technical ends of what different parts of intaglio are. Intaglio means anything that is sort of inscribed into the metal plate. So you can do it in many ways, some of which use acid, some of which you don't. Um, sometimes people will just say etching, but it may have aquatin, it may have all those other kinds of techniques involved in it. The, the concept is not really, if you look at my work, you would, I couldn't tell you half of what's in there, how I made the mark. It's irrelevant. It, that it's an Italio is, but you know, it's a beautiful, hard-edged, incredible, action-filled, claustrophobic print. Okay, this is a liner cut. So you can see the precision of the marks in here, which is why I think the one that we saw before was not. <laughs> but again, eerie and gloomy, love it. Okay, this is a Lynn Ward, okay? This is a wood engraving? Yes, this is a wood engraving. Okay, part of his Vertigo series, and we saw one of, I think you showed one of them. Um, beautiful, beautiful little print. Very, very, very small. This is like three by five, okay? So the amount of detail that he got in there, in the three by five, and with a wood engraving is, is different from, it's, it's the end grain of a wood, and it's just a knife making little marks. And again, you, then you roll your ink over it and print it. And it's beautiful. Okay, again, also part of the Vertigo, this is the third print in the Vertigo series. Okay. A color lithograph, a uh, lithograph, right? Um, when you do color, each separate individual color has to have its own block or own plate or own stone, okay? Which, and when you layer them, you have to print one over the other over the other. So registration becomes very important because many a great print has been ruined by something shifting or something being printed upside down. Um, so this is a slightly cheerier print. We do do happy. <laughs> um, again, a color piece, frenetic. The, the mark making all reinforces the freneticness of the dance, which is really, really nice, okay? Another color piece. It, all this is to show you is that the WPA was not, the prints in particular were not all just sad pieces or morose pieces. I mean, they, they did do, they did talk about daily life in it and describe what was around them. And they have a sense of humor. This is uh, sailing, they call it sailing, so essentially a drunken sailor. <laughs> okay, and we come to Lynn Ward. Um, sorry, <laughs> Louis Schenker. Yeah, thank you. I'm busy with Lynn Ward. Okay, Louis Schenker. Louis Schenker was one of the few abstracted, I'm going to say abstracted because it was organically based, but abstracted artists that were uh, well known during the WPA and part of the WPA. And in fact, he was for a time one of the administrat administrators of the New York WPA offices and responsible for sort of overseeing it, but he apparently hated it so much that he didn't last very long in it. He was an artist and that's what he wanted to do. He was one of, and one of the founding groups of what they called the Whitney <coughs> 10. Um, now the Whitney 10 was a group of 10 artists, including himself, including Mark Rothko, who had a different name then, he shortened it later, and a bunch of other names who you would know who were abstracted, abstract artists who were protesting the Whitney Museum because the Whitney Museum was not showing enough abstract art. So they won um, in the end. Um, and in fact, the Whitney was showing some of their work at the same time, so I don't understand what they were protesting about, but, okay. But he was also, yeah, I have to understand, he was also very 
uh, important in trying to process through some of the younger abstract artists at the time that working during the WPA who were sort of pushed aside because of the pre 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 predominant social realist marks. Okay, so one of those was the drip guy. The, what drip? Jackson Pollock. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Really? Bad. Okay, so Jackson Pollock was one of the the, his younger artist. And as an aside, and a sort of a nice little roundabout, I don't know if any of you have gone to the Met yet to see the Thomas Benton, uh, re, they, they reproduced, they reproduced, sorry, they reinstalled from the old um, uh, school, new school, the murals, that his murals, in great exacting detail, including the moldings, it is astronomical. And there's, there is a show that goes around it that's, that's ending next week, but the murals, I believe, are there forever. Um, it just, hmm? Don't miss it. Do, don't, do not miss it. It is just a great, great show. And in there, as an aside, is a portrait of Jackson Pollock, who posed, who was a, a student of Thomas Benton's and <laughs> posed for this as someone else. So you can see him in there as, as an aside. It, it really is a small world. But anyway, so this is called Cops and Pickets. It's a woodcut. Oh, oh sorry. I don't know how to get out of this now. Oh, there you go. Ah. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, this is Three Men on a Bench, if you can tell. Um, but he's reducing these organic shapes, these organic figures, into black and white shapes in a woodcut with the marks are sort of all important and the the use of where they shift from what's positive and what's negative whereas the the face of the man in the center is a black face with white outline and the guy next to him is white shape with a black outline the guy doesn't have, next to him on the other side doesn't have any it's a beautiful shifting of space forward and backwards ah, that was it um, so it was a, a sort of a nice way to round out um, Louis Shanker was actually just, again, another slide, was actually the reason why this show came about because his nephew, um, Lou Siegel, contacted me and said, I want to show his work. And I saw the bigger show and said, absolutely. And so that's how, that's how we sort of got this show. Yes? Oh, as opposed, yeah. As opposed to, like, why Robert Blackman wasn't the WPR. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, the right, right, yeah. And I think it's really important yeah. because if you looked at Robert Blackman and some of the work he did at the time, you would think he was a WPA artist. Right, 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 exactly, yeah. And, and, and also, my other question is yeah. how many women versus how many men? And, and, and I will even refine that further how many blacks versus how many whites. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and it isn't because I did work at Blackburn's workshop for many, many years. Um, and he was a wonderful, wonderful, generally open man, just a, very giving and always connecting. I, he hadn't seen you in two weeks and he'd be like, oh, no, me, wait, how you been? It's like you were the only person in the world. But I digress. Okay, so the credentials, there was very sort of strong credentials. So you had to be established. You had to prove that you were established. You had to be an American citizen, which is why, and I won't even try to remember the name because Apparently can't remember names anymore. Um, he was the Dutch guy who uh, did abstract. De Kooning. Right, right. Who wasn't an American citizen. So he was a WPA for a while, and then they kicked him off because he wasn't an American <laughs> citizen. Um, so you had to be an American citizen. You had to be established and prove yourself. Now, uh, yes, very important. You had to prove you actually needed the money. <laughs> um, sorry, that was, I thought, yes, that's true. Now. When we say that, however, the, the most unclear one was establishment because the hurdles that the black artists had to go to go through were far more than the white artists had to go through. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. I'm sure a lot of artists didn't even try. Now, I know that Blackburn was part of the Harlem Renaissance, and so that whole group of artists, and I, and as well as writers and and he was really sort of involved with that. Um, and he lives his old, he, he lived, he, he died 
few years ago. Um, he, he lived his whole life as if he was still in the WPA. He was always giving people a chance and you know opportunities to work. If you had no money, it didn't matter. You could sweep floors and earn your time at the print center, which was not great for him, it was great for the artists. <laughs> um, and so th those levels of trying to prove that you were established, A, was more difficult because black artists were not getting shown. So you couldn't prove a legacy of, of, of show credentials, which is the same for women. So I don't have the figures of how many women and blacks versus, but I can pretty much tell you that majority were white men. Yeah, Doc Srash was African American, um, and there are a few others involved. He was perhaps the most famous of all of them, but in order to get onto it, you really sort of had to jump through a lot of hurdles, and it was much more difficult. And I'm sure a lot of people just at some point, just like today, bureaucracy was like, yeah, whatever, I'll starve. Question: Does Jacob Lawrence and Emily Dillard meet here during their period of WPA? I know you don't know. Right. It's very, it's very possible. There, there's a lot, and uh, I believe that they might have actually been. There's a lot of, I, I don't know for sure, and, and there's lists that vary from time to time. If you look on the web, you'll find different lists and different names, and I believe that at one point I saw one, one or both of those names on there. Um, and again, they, they would probably meet the criteria very easily without having to sort of jump through too many hurdles. Um, and whether they were in there and they, they could carry other people on their back, uh, you know, I don't like. I, I want to keep our students in our mm -hmm. in school as a teacher for years, right. videos that show them as sort of products and having gotten uh, training. I know that um, Jacob Lawrence worked with Kemper, which was right. I don't, right. for some reason it's in my mind that they were. Yeah, it's very, it's very possible. Now, it, the, the mediums that a lot of people used were also because they were inexpensive, like tempera and, um, in in Mexico, where they didn't have any kind of WPA system, so but they were equally as poor. They used, they did what was inexpensive. They created prints that were easy to do and inexpensive and the cheapest. There was a lot of lithography, and there was uh, a lot of woodcut. But and and well, yeah, yeah. But I think it was more. I think mostly, if you look at the Mexican ones, it's more lithography than anything because the stone was there. And it was just grease, stone, you're done with it, you scrape it down, you do it again. <laughs> yeah? I'm just wondering, once you were, once somebody was on the roster for WPA, would they have to reapply each time a new project came? Uh, no, no, no. Once you were on, you had to, the, I, think, I think the way it worked was that the WPA had the right, like the right of first refusal. So they, they could, if you made a print, they could say yes or no, they want it or they don't want it. You don't have to reapply. They could kick you off, as they've done. If they prove that, you know, not that you've not done great work, but that you know you're not a American citizen, or they find something else, or you know you no longer need it, you know you you inherited a million dollars, you know however it worked that they could they could kick you off, but you didn't have to reapply. The the ones that were always sort of working towards the muralist, which was much more complex because they were always having to apply for getting mural projects, and that was how you made your your living. I mean, it wasn't like print. Printers could just, you know, you make print. And many of them were teaching. It, yes, it, yes, and teaching and doing other things. <laughs> right. Like Harlem or. Exactly. So they were very much part of the scene, whether in Philadelphia or. Or New York or anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what happened to the editions of print? Was there a oh, dissolution? Yeah, let me, I, I have a, a sort of a sad, very sad, sad story to talk about that. When, when you talked about, you talked about the erasing of the WPA stamp. And that, that has a lot to do with what happened to all of these prints. So um, the WPA, uh, again, th this is like a cycle because it all comes back to the same thing, okay? So the WPA became looked at as a government handout, okay? And that became a detriment to the prints. And they became looked at as just, you know, it's just a government-funded project and who cares? So the prints lost value. So by 43, when the, when the WPA was officially disbanded, um, they actually had an auction of the prints, of what they had. And, but then they, they were selling them by the ton. 
So it was the paper they wanted, not the prints. So there is a story that a plumber, and I don't know how true this is, but it's apocryphal that a plumber bought, I don't know, a ton of this paper and used it to insulate his pipes. <laughs> yes. So it goes to show you there's a cycle of things that constantly goes around, cycle and cycle. And so, but so they got destroyed, they got abandoned, they were fires, water floods, wrapping pipes, you know, whatever. So there's not a whole lot of them left around. But well, the decision teller, the Kirkus decision teller has a wonderful collection of what he's doing. And it's uh, been fine since she's a wonderful gallery in New York. And there are, she's been yeah. able to pull together a good collection yeah. of work, yeah. which is how we were able to borrow 38 from her. Mm -hmm. And she's speaking at our opening next Sunday. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. okay. We're not talking about prints at all, um, uh, but anyhow, we just, that's why we're here today, to hear what you have to say. So <laughs> but, but actually, it, it, it seems like you talk about American regionalism, because it, that translates whether it's in prints or in the murals. Yeah. I mean, the, the regional styles were the regional styles. The, the, only, uh, the only real difference I see between murals and prints, besides technique, is that, um, that the murals had to be a little bit um, upbeat. <laughs> And, and they were controversial as well. Yes, yes. Well, yes, they were, some. but yes, some were, absolutely. But the, 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 the one thing I will give FDR credit for, which, which I don't think he gets enough credit for, is that he understood how he could use print and art to further his agenda, which was to get everyone back to work again. And, I, and you, you sort of talked about that, and I, I don't think it's stressed enough that, that he really understood how to use art and not to dismiss it. And I'll tell you, the, the only uh, area that had a truly different look was California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they always are. They're a little <laughs> more neat. I I anyone from California, I apologize. <laughs> from California, uh, uh, and I should have, but it seemed like we were focusing on, uh, you know, a, a certain look, and the work from California was, uh, anyway, were and it didn't have, an, the ones that I saw didn't have enough graphic, uh, didn't pull together as some, didn't resonate as, not that they weren't as good, but it didn't resonate, and we weren't able to show kind of a, a cohesiveness that we wanted to right. show in the right. exhibition. It ended up being more of an anomaly. Than right, right, so we, it was more of an East Coast show than, yes. than, a, than of an American show. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. the studio still around. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Lou Siegel's going to come next yeah, Sunday as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was a local guy. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, great. Did Lou Zoni and Robin have anything? Do you want, anyone want to add? No, we'll, we'll have the lecture tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here at 7 o'clock tomorrow. 7 o'clock, be here. <laughs> Society and collected a lot of information. Ginny Ryder, her paper is stacked there, but she really did a phenomenal job on getting information on the WPA. And these four, this is not a complete set. There are two more of these transportation series that have been lost. So uh, this is only part. And actually upstairs in the children's room, there used to be a Charles Lindbergh uh, seat that's no longer there. Uh, and, and, I, and I would add, just as a little plug, slides don't do these prints justice. You gotta go see them. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> if I say so myself. Yeah. And Nellie, your, your exhibit is upstairs? <laughs>
Yeah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I have a show upstairs. It's on, um, uh, it's on the, uh, an Iraqi street bombing on, called Al Mutanabi Street. And it was a project that I was working on for a portfolio that I had to create a piece for. And I don't do well under pressure. So in order to make this one print, I had to do a whole body of work, which is upstairs. You'll see it upstairs. Uh, well, they, oh, they're doing a reading. Yeah, they're doing a reading from the book, which the whole print series started from, called Al Multanabi Street Starts Here. And that'll be Saturday the 25th. And it, it should be really good, because there's some beautiful pieces in the, in the book. Barbara, were you part of the WTN uh, looking around for the Jenny and? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So, thank, thank you. you.